the main topics we're, we're talking about, you know, the, the barriers preventing more Latinos from being involved in soccer in the U.S. You know, is it money, lack of access to fields, cultural, transportation, language? Clearly, um, you know, there's, there's less Latinas playing than Latinos in sport. Um, again, the immigration status, which of course right now is, is front and center. Um, so, so with that, Ed, if I, could, if I could start with a question for you. You came up with a model that focused on breaking the poverty cycle for educational attainment, not just soccer. <coughs> Why did you go um, with that approach? And what do you think what you've done, and do you think what you've done in San Antonio can be transferred to other parts of the country and other people can take away tools from what you've done? Well, I think everybody up here shares that commitment that it's more than the sport, and I think the responsibility, regardless of what youth sport, is to develop uh, good citizens and future leaders of our community, which, again, re requires in our world today an education. Being on the school board, that's another commitment that I have, is making sure that all our kids have a pathway uh, to higher education. So it became a natural part of our commitment at USLA. Uh, we are committed to nurturing and providing all underserved population students the opportunity to become lifelong leaders and scholar athletes through a high quality soccer experience. That's our commitment. But the reason that it helps us to sustain <coughs> our organization is because if we only talked about soccer to business leaders or the potential sponsors, there would not be a lot of interest unless they played soccer. And so our message and our commitment in our message is what resonates to donors and business leaders is to break the cycle of poverty for this underserved population uh, to focus. 51% of our program is leadership development, college and career pathway, uh, l looking at community <laughs> service as a requirement for every team, every season, so that they have a, a deep resume when they apply for college. 49% uh, of it is soccer. And the challenge is getting our coaches to understand that, getting our players to understand that, because all they want to do is play soccer. But uh, <coughs> when we now have high school graduates going to soccer, we can demonstrate the, the result when they trust our process and are committed to the program that uh, they will become a lifelong leader and a scholar athlete. Yeah, and I think that that's a great takeaway how important those you know, measurable outcomes, measurable outputs, so that <clears throat> you can really state your, the impact you're having, whether it's going after a federal grant, state foundation, working with the school system, it, it's huge, so thank you. Um, Hugo, uh, Latinos who form their own soccer leagues often become afraid that their best teams and players will be plucked away by the suburbs. How do you build trust to empower them to improve their league so players and teams won't leave? I believe it's coming much closer with, uh, with, with, with those clubs because uh, the parents are beginning to understand that that's the next step up. So our job <coughs> in, in, in Southern California and with the foundation is to create as many good players, you know, and then they go, that's the next step that we tell the parents and the, uh, the league owners because they're, they're not, they're the owners. And that's the biggest promise that we have had in the past. But now they're beginning to know that there's a, a step forward they can go to better places and they can be seen by you know, more colleges. You know, before they were afraid because we were not creating enough players at the bottom. We were discussing right now <clears throat> that in the past maybe each league had only like maybe 10 players, good players. Now we helping them to produce 20 or 30 players. So those things that still go are not affecting the, the play of the, of the teams. And the cooperation now with some of the uh, academy clubs is becoming better. In Los Angeles, we have uh, Galaxy and we have the new team coming up, uh, LAFC. So now we're working with them also to try to help us by creating and give us opportunity to have also coaches coming to speak to, to our kids. But the most important for us in Max in Motion is to tell the college coaches to come and talk to our players and our coaches. Yeah, thanks, Hugo. And I jump in on, oh, yeah, on sure. that, you know, my, I mean, and, and I think that's exactly right, everything Hugo is saying, but you know, the other thing that happens a lot of times in these communities is you'll see the, what, what would be a club locally, a rural community club, 
will kind of get broken apart because the coaches can make some money coaching for another club or they take this good player or that good player, some going to affiliated you know, soccer clubs, some to just another guy hustling in the neighborhood. And you know, what we find is we really come to sports, um, and, and I know I'm talking to everybody here, it's the same thing. You know, we're excited about soccer from a community development, from a youth development standpoint, not just the elite athlete standpoint, really folk come to it almost from a social service you know, area. And you've got to treat the whole kid, you got to treat the whole family. And so if you offer something locally that is sensitive to the parents, that engages them and listens to them and incorporates them, uh, if you offer a type of coaching that um, is appropriate uh, age-wise and the kids love it and, and they're into it, they'll stay and play locally and they'll be a part of that community club and they won't get plucked away. And you can actually develop quite robust, you know, community institutions. And, and then you can take that strength and then travel them around and get them out of the neighborhood and expose them. But, you know, so I think it really starts uh, in terms of, uh, you know, n a little bit not making the goal always the, the college scholarship. The goal is to get to college. You, very small people are going to get recruited or, or ever play professionally. But, you know, uh, communicating, listening, you know, tangible pathways towards, you know, whatever those goals yeah. are. And that's a really good point, I think, too. As people mentioned, the different industries and sectors you're all from, really connecting with those community service providers <clears throat> in your community. Because often, you know, sports is a separate conversation from health and wellness, but really it's the same. And so making sure that we're making those community, community connections so kids stay in the community. What role, if any, do you think U.S. soccer and MLS can or should play in trying to make sure Latino youth aren't left behind? I mean, that's like a crazy, thorny question that like, I mean, it's very complicated the way soccer's used up in the country. And I like, I, you know, I don't even know how to get into the, into the answer other than, you know, I want to say that that's a part of the equation, okay? Like the, the uh, MLS is, you know, sport and entertainment. It's elite soccer and they, they're doing a great job. You know, we're doing something different. This is community, you know, development work. And, and that's one, honestly, small part of the overall equation. Like, I think what Ed's done is an incredible model. I think, like, you know, it's, it's really more about the other pieces being in place. It's about the school systems, about local elected officials and, like, uh, respecting them and talking to them and engaging them in your work. Um, it's about all those other partners. And if you put that in place, that's something really powerful that MLS, that U.S. soccer can capitalize on but you got to build it from the grassroots up. And, and that, that's what we're really committed to doing. And I think we're building something that, and we, we see it, you know, um, we're, we're, we, we mentioned LA, um, we're really proud. The LA84 Foundation has enabled us to come uh, to, we've been doing some work in Boyle Heights, but really come uh, to LA and, and, and they helped us engage the city council there. So everyone's invested. We have good local partners. We're not replicating what's already done. We're working with the people that are already working. And now LA Galaxy is going to come in and help create a tournament bring their players is going to raise more money and awareness for the program. So I think if we build it, then uh, those athletes, uh, you know, they can take advantage of what we've done. It can be mutually beneficial. They can plug in. What I don't think uh, the clubs need to do is, is go do the community work themselves. They can plug in and, and, and frankly, learn from all that. I mean, not, not Street Soccer USA, very proud of our curriculum and our knowledge, but there are tons of great people in, in all the cities we work in across the country with a lot of great knowledge. So it's hard, it's not easy for the pro soccer to figure out how to do that, but that's where they need to be thinking, I think. You know, and, and a whole different question from a um, you know, U.S. soccer perspective. Um, you know, how do we, I think that's the big question for this panel. It's like, there, we see so many kids uh, that are playing, I mean, you, the, everyone says, oh, soccer in the United States is a suburban sport for guys that look, look like me, right? And it's just not true. The kids are playing soccer. They're just not part of the system. They're not plugged in. We're not paying attention to them. And I think U.S. soccer needs to figure out how to, you know, connect with that. And the existing institutions, I mean, they're, they're amazing state associations that have been around forever. They're like awesome bodies. Uh, but, you know, they're, uh, they're, they're, they need, they're going to have to be flexible in new ways if they want to grow beyond where they are now because they've, they've done an amazing work. Now, like the frontier where we're working, um, you know, that, that, that's a different ball game, frankly. And, uh, you know, they, they, we got to have more of a dialogue and more flexibility uh, and, and sensitivity because the answer is not, 
for, for a lot of our folks, you know, you take them out of their community and put them in an academy club, are we setting them up for success or, or not? Uh, you know, sometimes it's great, but sometimes it depends on the kid, but you, you got to be sensitive. I mean, I, I, and I'll get off my diatribe now, but my, my whole work, you know, when I got involved working um, at a homeless center, you know, my great fear was I would do more harm than good, getting involved, getting very excited, and then leave, leave people lower than when I left. And, and we, we frankly go into communities where I'm not from. I mean, we do train from the bottom up, and, and the idea is to have the programs run, you know, locally. But you, you got to be very sensitive in this work and very humble when you go about it. Um, and I think, I think that's, the, that's, a, that's a tough perspective for big bodies to take, but that's the one they need to do to be successful. Yeah. And just to reinforce uh, Lawrence's comment about it has to start in the grassroots and work its way up. In San Antonio, I met recently with the president and owner of the San Antonio FC, uh, which is under the San Antonio Spurs, part of the USL program for their academy program that they established two years ago. And they showed the demographic and how proud they were that uh, 50, 60 percent were Hispanic. But my question to them opened their eyes because I said, well, have you plotted where these Hispanics live? And uh, they, they hadn't. And I said, I would guarantee most of these live in the suburbs. And keep in mind, San Antonio is 70 percent Hispanic. Uh, we probably have uh, less than 20 percent that are immigrant or first generation. So we have second generation, third generation, fourth generation, beyond. And so there is a difference even within the Hispanic culture of socioeconomic levels and how are we reaching out to the underserved, the at-risk populations. Uh, those are the populations that are not being served, that are very hard to get to, that we have focused on. We have our home games in one of the toughest areas of San Antonio, so clubs from the suburbs come and have their games there, and it's a different experience for them, uh, especially when there's a shooting and there's helicopters <laughs> flying over during a home game on <coughs> Saturday morning, a beautiful Sunday, Saturday morning. So it's a different dynamic. But that's the population, regardless of it's African American, Hispanic, Asian, you name it. In San Antonio, it's predominantly Hispanic. Uh, but I often tell folks, if you want to see a future of America, go to San Antonio, go to Texas, which is now a majority minority population, and see where good things are happening in those underserved communities. And those are the solutions that MLS and U.S. soccer need to highlight to be able to move forward. In what way does U.S. soccer, U.S. youth soccer, try to grow participation with underserved youth? And what more do you think could be done in the Latino community? Well, first of all, uh, I agree with everything that's been said here by uh, my fellow panelists. Um, uh, Ed, what you talked about with respect to um, you know, taking programs to underserved communities uh, is, a, is a great first start. We have a program called Soccer Across America that serves uh, 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 kids in underserved, uh, disadvantaged populations. and. Um, and so that's, that's number one. But then I, I would also frame it in the context of sort of uh, opportunities and, and challenges. Um, one of my favorite quotes, and I don't generally go around quoting former defense secretaries, but known <laughs> unknowns. Um, we recognize at U.S. Youth Soccer and at U.S. Soccer, uh, you know, where U.S. Youth Soccer is the largest member of U.S. Soccer Federation, that um, there's a lot we just simply don't know about who's playing soccer in America. We know, for example, that there are uh, 3.1 million players who are registered through uh, our, one of any number of our state associations. Um, and they, they, of course, are, are also members of U.S. Soccer Federation. There's a universe of other youth players who make up the Federation's youth membership. The, the challenge is we have no quantifiable uh, data source where we can aggregate all of the, the uh, registrants, the participants, who are playing at the grassroots uh, that um, 
uh, in, a, in a structured way, we, we have no way of, of aggregating all of this data and analyzing it and doing predictive analytics and looking at different communities across the country, identifying who makes up a minority population, who doesn't. But, but the opportunity is we're, we're getting there. We, uh, both we and U.S. Soccer are partnering with respective organizations uh, to build the technology that will allow us to become much smarter about our membership. And I say all of that to, to say that it, it starts with knowing who your members are, uh, and that's the first step in being able to meet their needs. And, and, but, but I'll say this too, that the challenge is that the data is, it, that uh, gets amassed or collected in this database is only as good as the inputs. And unfortunately, what we find in uh, various um, state association registration data is that many of the Latino families who register, uh, many don't have uh, credit cards, um, and they're bringing cash to you know the, a Saturday league, and their mom, who tends to be the gatekeeper, is very reluctant to provide data to the state association. And in our case, state association is probably a clinical term. It sounds like agency, which sounds like government, which sounds like I'm not giving you my information. Um, so that's one of our biggest challenges, and, and, and I think uh, once we have a sophisticated way of capturing data in real time, that will benefit um, uh, the entire industry. The first question is, what has worked when attempting to remove the stigma that soccer is just for boys, but rather for all? Who would like to take that one? I mean, I, I'd say w w um, creating a separate space. I mean, just before the demands there, um, you know, has been key. And we, um, because uh, for a number of reasons, slightly different each community, uh, you know, girls can get crowded out. But, you know, it's uh, just cre creating that space and standing for it early has, has been a big help for us. Yeah, again, speaking with the Latino, uh, you know, it's been more difficult because of this, you know, <clears throat> the machismo type of things. But uh, having more access to, uh, you know, the national team in the U.S. and also a lot of uh, the women uh, that play for Mexico actually went to universities here has helped. Uh, I just got a text yesterday from one of my sons who were also involved with, with the game that uh, a lot of uh, young Latinas are beginning to, to emerge to colleges. You know, now we see more. So that's going to help us, you know, to, to show that it's not only for the boys, but also for the girls. It's also having uh, women coaches and not you know, me answering that question, but having our, uh, having our staff be there visible and representative. And our schools do a great job, better job than clubs to, to provide that opportunity and environment for uh, female athletes. And if you look in the middle school, the high school program, their numbers are lower than on the male side, but they're much higher than you would see on the club side. And so we have to work with the high school coach uh, for the uh, female programs and the middle schools to try to develop the relationship to get more uh, young ladies out to try soccer because uh, they're playing it in the school uh, so it's it's free it's accessible they get a grade and so that's probably why it's more acceptable to the family the parent for them to participate uh, when you talk about investment or even paying a little bit that's where we tend to lose uh, girls in soccer at least in the inner city at significant rates yeah I mean those are the rates inner city you know girls are the ones um, in terms of get sort of knocked out early if there's economic challenges or other challenges. And definitely your point on f women coaches and that, that could be a whole other panel. That could be a, a year long conversation actually. <laughs> but yes, more women in coaching. And we probably have a couple other questions. Yes, so the next question will be, if level one is getting Latino youth involved in sports through soccer, how do we reach level two, getting them involved in a wide range of sports? I think uh, education, uh, did you say wide range of sports? Yes. Um, I think uh, educating parents um, on the importance of multi-sport participation is, is key. Um, uh, the Aspen Institute and Project Play does uh, a really great job of providing those insights. And we as leaders in our respective organizations and our respective sports 
uh, should probably uh, do more to promote the importance of participating uh, in other sports. Uh, we at US Youth Soccer don't look at other sports as competitors. Um, we look at the calendar and we recognize that we share players uh, during different uh, seasons of the, of the year. Uh, so that would be my recommendation to, to really uh, promote multi-sport play. And I would just say patience because, again, if it's the immigrant, they're going to gravitate to soccer because in the home country, soccer is king. But as they get to second generation, third generation, the kids start to play other sports because they're in a school that offers more. So, again, it depends on where they are in that cycle of generational immigration to the United States or assimilation that dictates what sport they tend to start participating in. I also <clears throat> saw for the first time in one of uh, very Latino communities uh, the NBA in, in, uh, you know, and also um, baseball. They, they spend a lot of money in the communities. In the city of Compton, you know, baseball put $10 million. You know, and I went to a gym uh, where I only used to see even indoor soccer, and now they were playing basketball. You know, so they are, as Ed said, you know, maybe it's the second generation that is beginning to, you know, be more on those sports. Yeah, I, I agree. It's like, I mean, certainly the cultural tendency towards soccer, and we have this amazing, particularly parent engagement relative to some other communities around the Latino communities, but it's about relationship. It's about the individual coach. It's not about the sport. If, it's, if there are no barriers, if it's accessible, if the coach is caring and sensitive, like the kids are going to come whether you're playing you know, tiddling links or side doesn't matter, they're gonna come for that uh, as opposed to the sport itself. Yeah, and that's another great comment about, you know, the coach, because often at levels of sport, you're often trying other sports just to have fun, just to break up the monotony. I mean, it shouldn't really be mon monotonous, um, so. And, and, yep. and if I may, one other point that I think is mission critical, I think we all in this room want to ensure that kids uh, are playing sports, period. When you look at some of the data that comes in from video game, gaming and, and um, uh, academ academics. There's an emphasis uh, in this country on uh, academic performance, which I don't think any of us would argue with. But the reality is, is that parents are finding many other things for their kids to do. My two boys, when they have time, they both are enrolled in sports, but when they have uh, uh, their academics come first, their band electives and other things come first. Um, and so our objective should be to ki keep kids in sports and not in video games and other uh, yeah. things that t uh, take their time. I mean, it's interesting, you made me think, like, you know, now we're, we go out, we have to, you know, sell our program, whether we charge for it or not, we don't. Uh, so, you know, it's the benefit, I mean, it's sports, but it's the benefits, and it's telling parents about the core, like kids do better in school grade-wise, and we have stats on our program, and we market that uh, to the parents as much as we do to, you know, foundation. And so it's, um, yeah, it's selling uh, the benefits of sports for sure. Well, thank you. Um, thanks, everyone, for attending. I just want to do another uh, shout-out to, um, to the guys on the panel. So thanks, Hugo, Chris, Ed, and Lawrence for everything. Let's give them a round of applause. And, and I was, as I was flying here yesterday, I mean, I've read the Project Play reports, you know, numerous times. But I have to say, I still go back on the website and read the specific eight strategies and, and how things are changing. And they, they, they are toolkits, those, those informational, um, you know, uh, brochures. And so I would encourage you, if you haven't already read those, and again, in your packets, you have the updated um, versions. But there's so much good information about what's working and, and how, to, how to follow some of these models and these great programs that are all over the country. So, so with that, thanks very much.